Hello, folks. It's John Pushkar, and I'm here again today to bring you another episode from the world of fuels and combustion system safety. And today, it's all about refractory. And I'm lucky enough to have one of the premier experts in the field of refractory, a guy who's been doing this for in his family for generations. I've got a gentleman named Bob Humphrey with me from Onyx Construction. Bob, say hi. Hey, John. Thank you for the invitation. No problem. Over the last 40 years, I've developed and led fuels and combustion equipment safety programs for the largest manufacturers in the world. Today, I'm bringing you knowledge, insights, and best practices about fired equipment and natural gas safety. Over the next few minutes, you'll get the kind of practical, real-life explanations that I've become known for. So today we're gonna to go through a little presentation that I've prepared where I'm gonna show you actual pictures of some refractory failures. I'm gonna explain different types of refractory. And today's really all about two things for you, the listener. Today's about understanding more about refractory, that uncool, unsexy part of every furnace oven boiler that frankly, although it's uncool and unsexy, we absolutely can't live without it. And today I'm going to communicate with you through Bob about some hazards and what the actual realities are of not recognizing these hazards. But coming out of today, you'll be better prepared to understand if and when you're in trouble and maybe what to do about it. So with that being said, let me take you to the presentation and share my screen here. And again, this is out of our Captain Obvious series. So Bob, tell us a little bit first about yourself, Onyx Construction, uh, what your sweet spots are in this industry, how long you've been doing this, a uh, little bit of a, a commercial for you and Onyx. Sure, John, th thanks again for the uh, opportunity to sit here and uh, have this discussion. I look forward to it and I always enjoy talking about refractories. Um, as far as my own history, um, as, as you pointed out, that my father was in the industry. Um, he was a, uh, on the brick manufacturing side with Kaiser and then National Refractories. And then, uh, so I sort of grew up in all the refractory hotspots in the world, um, traveling around from fire clay deposit to fire clay deposit. Um, so when I was done with school, wasn't sure which direction to go. Well, you know, it was one of those kids, not 100% clear what I wanted to do. And the, you know, stumbled into an opportunity with um, one of the one of my father's competitive companies, and it would have been AP Green Refractories at the time, and uh, you end up with an opportunity to be a serviceman for them in the steel industry. Uh, spent a year or so on a daily basis walking around steel mills, watching guys line ladles, counting brick, pouring castable covers, things like that for a good year, and then uh, worked my way into the sales side of things. So I did uh, the manufacturing sales from AP Green through Harvest and Walker um 17 18 years um you know all of it in the sales function whether it was a field sales or a sales manager and then in 2013 decided it was time to make a slight change and went to work for um one of my customers the first contractors I ever actually on a uh, job site with and uh, we've maintained a good tight relationship here with uh, Ken Fennerty who was the president of Onyx and at some point he'd asked me and said hey why don't you come try this out it was something in the back of my head I'd always sort of wanted to do. And it just, you know, the opportunity was there and it was, it was the right time for us, for my family and for myself. And uh, we made that transition and it's been, uh, it's been a, a pleasure since being on the construction side. It's a completely Great. different. So I, I thought I knew more about the construction side than what I did when I got here. So I learned really quickly that I didn't know a whole lot from gotcha. that standpoint. So, so when other kids were pushing dirt around the yard with little play Tonka trucks, your dad was bringing home refractory bricks and saying, you know, oh, here, yes. here, kid, right? Oh, yeah, I learned how to stack a pile of brick early, early on. Gotcha. So I'm showing here all the different types of refractory products that I know about. Can you just give us a, a, a brief overview of the types of refractory that are out there, how they're used? Yeah, sure, John. The uh... The primary um, selection refractories or classification refractories are really 
you know, from my understanding, the way we've done it is you've got your brick, your, your brick side of things, and then you have your specialty side of things. You know, the, the brick side, it's pretty clear and obvious. You know, you've got everything from a high aluminum brick to an insulation fire brick um, and a wide range of, of recipes, depending on the application it's going towards. And then you've got specialties, and specialties encompass a much, much larger range of refractories. That would be your, your insulation fiber, uh, your refractory ceramic fibers, um, castables, you know, everything from conventional, more concrete-like, cement-like materials to self-flowing, you know, high technology, um, uh, you know, specialties, castables uh, that include uh, gunite, gunning materials, shot crates. Uh, well, those are all just different ways to apply the, the castables. So some of them, you know, you've got the castable side of things, and then you have ram plastics, um, you know, and, and there's a number of ram plastics. So the plastic comes, it contains a, a little degree of moisture already in it, and you're adding it to the wall in slabs, and you're using air hammers to uh, drive it into place, to ram it into place into different shapes. Um, you have similar versions called dry vibe that uh, you, you did, it's center out with uh, temperatures, temperatures at them. You, you vibrate them into a shape. They have a little bit of moisture to hold that shape, and then you center them into place. And then you have, um, what's another area we've got? Uh, we've got the different fibers, right? So, and the fiber itself comes in multiple uh, um, multiple forms, be it uh, rolled in a box like, uh, like, like we have there in the picture. Um, in this particular design, that would be a wallpaper design furnace to the top right. Sometimes it's stack bonded. Sometimes they're fiber modules. Sometimes that fiber comes in form of uh, preformed boards. Um, so the, the specialty side of things is a much wider range. And it's really intended to make the installation application a little bit easier, a little less, um, little less skill, I guess was probably the right way to put it, a little less uh, easier to install. It, you know, whereas a, to turn a uh, you know, a cone with a brick is a, is a little bit of a challenge and you need, you know, very skilled tradesmen to do that. Um, I can turn that same cone with a ram plastic and you and me, John, could get out there and figure out how to do it and make it look good. So it's just not the same skill set, but it also, you know, not the same life expectancy. So it's one of these things you're, you're weighing, you know, the application, the, the, the contractors are available to install it and the, and the overall time performance plus the cost of it. I mean, so it's, these are all dollar cost average kind of scenarios you look at. Does it, does it make sense well, for me to come in and repair something, you know, in a year or in five years? You know, and all so, those are figured into the material selections. Okay, so in, in our prep talk we had, you said you, you, you used a phrase that I thought was just wonderful. You said something about refractory is like engineered to fail or it's, got an engineered life expectancy. Can you repeat that for me, please? Because it was a marvelous saying. <laughs> for sure. So, so we always refer to refractories as designed engineered failure. Refractory is not permanent. No refractory is going to last forever unless you never use the furnace, in which case it'll last forever. So it is intended to fail. It is part of the process of your manufacturing process. Um, there are, you know, de depending on the application we're in, in the steel industry, for example, there's a certain amount of, you know, there's a certain amount of material that you know that you're pulling from a steel ladle into that steel bath that's part of the chemistry of the steel. So there's, it's all designed and intended to, to, to work together with the application. So gotcha. it's, you know, it's all designed to fail. It's just, if you can control those factors and you, you optimize that life expectancy, but there's still you know, your half-life where things start going down to where you're suddenly, you know. and, and And one more thing that just demonstrates how crazy this really is. And, and the overall intent of this slide is to make you all feel like refractory is somewhat complex and there are many different types. But let me just tell you a little story about a recent client of mine. It's called Kyanite. Mining Corporation, over about an hour and a half drive west in the mountains uh, outside of Richmond, Virginia. Kyanite is a very special mineral. And I'm showing you the bricks there on the left-hand slide. And you see the arch that's formed? I had never heard of kyanite before in my life. 
Um, we helped them do an LNG project. They were burning oil in some of their process dryers and furnaces. And the kyanite product is used in those bricks because it is one of the only minerals in the world that has special thermal characteristics such that when you heat it, it expands, but when you cool it back down, it doesn't, doesn't contract proportionately. So it's great for making arches like that with ceramic brick. So um, the point there is when Bob talks about bricks, Bob, we, we don't have to get into this into, I, I, you could probably spend two hours talking about bricks, but a ceramic brick is not a ceramic brick, is not a ceramic brick, right? That's, you're absolutely correct. You're absolutely correct. And, and if you get to the guys who really know what they're talking about, they'd say we're not even allowed to call them ceramic because they're refractory, because the gotcha. bond's different. It may have a ceramic bond in it, but they're not considered a ceramic brick, they're considered refractory brick. And the chemistries, you know, the, the, the wide variety of, of chemistries all dependent on the application. Gotcha. Um, so let's just talk about what the functionality is. I like to tell people, well, you know, carbon steel starts to change properties like 850 degrees, a typical carbon steel beam, for example, and it'll start to change color. The carbon will start to come out of the steel, disassociate, it'll get weaker, it'll lose strength, it'll start to warp. Um, eventually you'll melt it, you'll burn through. And if you burn through a casing, and I know you've got some pictures that show that, that's kind of ugly. But if you burn through and start to impact the structure, you can collapse the structure. Um, I like to tell people carbon steel and refractory don't stretch, not the same coefficient of expansion or contra contraction. So um, you start to break down the refractory, it kind of gets into a death spiral. You, you agree with that? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. No, it, it's, that's, that's a very good point. Um, you know, one of the one of the one of the arts in the design of refractories is understanding that 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 difference in coefficients, right? When it comes to expansion, you have to make allowance because they do not expand at the same rate. They're similar, but it's definitely not the same. I mean, I've seen applications where, in a you know, the, the wrong amount of expansion was added into a wall, and that wall, the refractory itself, expanded more than the steel would allow it, and it actually, you know drove the buck stays open and you lost the entire wall on a furnace. What, it, what's a buck stay? The amount of force are, 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 are staggering. Pardon T me, John? Tell us what a buck stay is. Oh, I'm sorry. The, uh, the, uh, in, this, in, in this particular case, it was the, uh, the corner beams that hold the, the corners and sides of the uh, furnace. And then you have rods that run over the top to hold it in place. So it's not a steel shell, but you have let's say you would have six beams running down each side those would be buck stays and then you have beams over top that, that allow it to sort of flex and move as it grows and heats up but it's to a very specific expansion allowance and if it's not calculated correctly into the refractory lining um, you'll you'll exceed that ability of, the, of those buck stays to move and you'll drive it out and you lose compression on your wall and your entire wall can collapse on you so the best way to destroy refractory for an operator of a furnace is what? <laughs> There's so many ways. There's so I understand. Good at it. Um, Give us some of your favorite. So, well, the, the, let's, let's take it the other way, John. Let's, the best, the most successful way to run refractory, a refractory line is to get it hot and leave it hot. If the, if the, the less stresses that I can put in a refractory lining, the, the longer that refractory lining will last. So the more, stresses, more, I mean, startups and, more startups and shutdowns are just kill you? Every time you start up and shut down, you, you, that, is that, that is that engineered, designed engineered failure, you are cracking that lining. You might not see the fractures, but they're there. That's, that's part of the thermal cycling. So you have you know, the thermal gradients within a lining temperature. Um, that alone causes stresses. And now as it heats and cools, those stresses are, are tested and push the refractory to its to its abilities, right? And as it's every time it shrinks and contracts, it's adding additional stresses in there, and that's when things start to crack. A lot of furnaces you'll see as they're cold, 
Um, someone who doesn't know what they're looking at might walk in and see a crack wall and a lining and, and be completely panicked that they have a crack in their furnace wall. Doesn't, doesn't matter because as they heat it back up, that refractory is going to expand back out, assuming it's the right refractory, and it, it will expand out and that, that crack will close up in process. But if, if someone who's new to an application hasn't seen that, you'll, a lot of times you'll have people come in and, and be rather excited their lining's cracked. Well, it's, it's almost impossible for you to run at an application, especially as you get over the you know, 22, 2300 degrees, you start seeing more significant expansions in materials. If you're running furnaces in that temperature, when they come down cold, you're going to have openings because that is that expansion. Part of the expansion allowance is, is built is built in and the expansion joints you add, but there's additional expansions happening across the, you know, the, the, the sections of that refractory. So there's always going to be cracking in refractory. The more you go up and down, the more, the more of those cracks you're going to get though. Gotcha. So, um, so, so know, up and downs, a, a life cycle, it's it up and downs a killer. Yes, sir. What, what about things like, like uh, losing the shape of flames and impinging directly on one spot? Well, sure. So, so again, it, it goes right, right back to that, those thermal stresses. If I have a flame that's, the, if I've got the tip of my flame and let's say our pressures are up too high and we're driving across the wall and we're impinging on the opposite wall, the direct impact of that flame impingement on the wall is going to make that section hotter than the section six or eight inches away. So now I've got a section here that's seen significantly higher temperature than just down, just you literally inches away, quite honestly. And then that creates these stresses. So this section here is trying to grow and move faster than this section right beside it. So as this is happening, you're going to start to see areas giving away and you'll see these movements and, and cracks that happen around those, those flame impingement areas. Gotcha. So here's some pictures that you sent. Can you tell me something about these photos and what might be well, sure. of the, interest here? These photos were just to demonstrate, you know, a variety of applications. So not not all applications are, are severe, you know, uh, steel mills and, and things are, you know, uh, steel ladles, you know, furnaces. There are other applications that are far more benign. For example, this bottom right picture here, this is just the floor in a uh, melt shop of a steel mill. Um, and this refractory is all being laid down here to protect the concrete in case we have, you know, a spill or break out in a ladle. It's protecting the concrete, which is also protecting the structures. And what you'll see is on the in that picture, those boxes to the right, or the boxed around those two beams coming down, that'll be filled with castable. So if they were to have a spill out, you know, the the, the steel isn't going to burn down the steel structure holding up the uh, the furnace above above the floor. Um, so there's a number of applications. You know, as you step up above that, you know, you were talking about earlier the 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 roof that you had in uh, the Kaonite furnace. This is a uh, another tunnel kiln furnace, you know, very similar. This particular one's probably a hundred and some odd feet long, um, and this is a very high temperature application. This application is probably 31, 3200 degrees Fahrenheit, and you just was demonstrating the sprung arch roof section of this, and you, you, you know, you've got your wall sections. This will be a, a tunnel kiln where your car would pull in, and uh, um, just want to demonstrate um, a sprung arch in that particular case. Again, brick, that's refractory brick there. And then the picture on the left is showing actually three different kind of products. Um, the product, uh, this is in a um, heat recovery system. Um, so the left wall, that is a super duty fire clay brick is what that is. So it's a denser high fired brick. The long wall that appears to be white brick, that's actually insulation brick, uh, IFB insulation fire brick. And then towards the front right corner, that is, those are fiber modules. So this isn't so much a, a high temp application, um, but uh, you know, just demonstrating that there are a variety of material selections and having the right material and the right zoning of the, you know, of the furnace or in this application, this, this re recovery system significantly impacts how the furnace is going to run and how efficient it is. So it's just having the right materials in the right spot, just demonstrating uh, multiple applications. You're making my head spin. This is making me feel like um, you don't want to grab somebody who's read a magazine article about refractory and use them to uh, design your system or make a repair, right? Well, I figure after about 
18 to 20 years, I'm just starting to figure some of it out. Gotcha. That's how I feel. The longer I'm in the business practicing, sometimes some days I feel like the less I know. So let's talk about some ways you might start to recognize you're having a problem. Uh, an obvious one is, you know, there's burned paint on the outside of a, of a casing. This is a little fire tube boiler and it's a back door of a boiler. And you could see in this to the left of our photos there, there's some discolored paint. Here's kind of a close up of that. And if you don't get to it at some point, you warp the door, the door keeps flu products from coming out at, at some point, much, at some point, bad things happen. You'll get flu products coming out. Um, you'll jeopardize the safety of the people working in the area. Well, the additional thing is, is go back to that picture, John, is, is sure. if, as, as you even notice the paint, you see how the paint sort of moving in an angle and sort of working its way up. That's, that's actually very indicative of what's happening inside with the heat in that lining. So there was probably something probably happened with the gasket, right? So the, you know, heat's, heat's very efficient at finding uh, the, the weak point in the lining. The gasket was probably compromised when it was closed up or, or, or you know, might not have been redone and, and set in place direct. So it probably had a malfunction there. And what you can see is the angle that that's the heat working its way back behind the refractory lining. And ah. the refractory lining is held in by anchors. And what happens is, in this, in this particular case, as that heat's working its way back, your refractory lining that's inside that shell is tied back with some sort of with some sort of steel anchor. And as you commented before, if it's carbon steel anchors at 850 degrees to 900 degrees, we're starting to compromise those, those anchors. And as they start to fail, your lining fails and pulls off. You, you, you literally pull giant chunks away off the lining because the anchors are what's holding it in place. If you respond to this quick enough, you know, you, you, the extent of your repair to get this back up in line is significantly less than if you allow this to, to, to propagate and continue. Well, I've seen guys repair these doors. And we'll, we could talk about that on the next slide about what some slight repairs are about. But this is a castable in there. Usually it's taken off the door. The door weighs thousands of pounds mm -hmm. and it's a castable. And you got guys in there with hammers busting out all the old stuff. Then you're welding in new hangers, um, and it's just, it's an ungodly repair to do it completely and correctly. That's why a lot of people end up buying rebuilt doors and then taking days or weeks to fix their old one. Sure. But, uh, yeah, point well taken about getting to it sooner rather than later. So, in fact, here's some places where some repairs and patching have been done. You must get called in all the time and people say, you know, because I've been through this. Uh, let, let me give you the scenario. Hey, Bob, I think we got kind of a, a mess on our hands. Can you come look? And you come look and you say, yeah, you do. Yep. I wish you'd have called me like six months ago. Um, it's pretty ugly right now. And then you probably get people saying, but, you know, listen, I'm sure you can get in there with like a, a five gallon pail or something, right? And splash some stuff on there. And can you give us, because we were going to come down in another month. Honest, we really were. John, have you been, have you been to some of my customers and given them? Yeah, well, oh, listen, this, it's universal. <laughs> so, so tell me about, you know, yeah, I can throw some stuff on there, but what does that do for you or help me with that whole scenario? Sure. So, you know, it's, it's for the right way to put it. Uh, um, so often something's broken, just flat out broken, not working. Putting a bandaid on it isn't going to repair what's broken. It's going to buy you that extra week or two until you come to that, come to that point where you can shut things down and do a proper repair. The big argument people have is, you know, some of these band-aids are very expensive repairs. Um, you know, materials are expensive, you know, to, to get into the right application or, you know, to, to, you know, to be able to get into the furnace at the right time to get things done is downtime. It's not, people don't understand that, that when I'm coming in to do these quick repairs, like this, for example, 
you know, sure, we could come in. I could slap trowel some some, you know, patching mortar on here, and, and get you could get back up and run. But it's not going to be a long term repair. And that's really what the issue comes down to. Is you know, it, it's people see they've spent so much money. Well, they want to get the value out of that money, so they're going to extend it longer. Um, coming in doing a quick little tuck point on a crack wall does not resolve what's going on in the end. It just buys you time to when you have it in your schedule to be able to do a significant repair. If you can't get back to the steel, identify where the issue is, add new hardware, whether it's tiebacks or V anchors or, or whatever. If you can't get it all the way back in there, if I can't work it all the way to the shell to do my repair, then it's, it's literally, it may last a week. It might last much longer, but it's not intended to be a permanent fix. And that's, that's the, you know, the struggle that some, some operators and some owners have is, is they see, well, you were here to fix this. Well, no, you gave me, you gave me one day to do what, you know, what we could to get you up and running. That's not fixing your problem. That's getting you up and running for a short period of time. Yeah. And, and I'm, and I'm guessing the rest of that story is, but you said this might get me another couple of weeks and only got me two days. True. Right? That's it. That's, that's uh, I thought you were right? guaranteeing it's, me. Right, right, so right. Yeah. Yeah. So I hear guarantee you. is a, uh, a word that we don't, we don't, we don't really like in our world. I mean, it's, everybody tries to sell it with you. I said, I guarantee you, if you, if you either don't run it or run it in exact controlled fashion, which they can never guarantee you, then it'll be fine. But <laughs> so this gets back to somewhat of this being a little bit of an art. You use that word and yeah. I could, I could see why. So it, it, it's, it, it, you can't, you can't, it's hard to replace the years of looking and looking and seeing those linings to understand what's going on because a refractory liner can be deceptive too. When you're looking at a hot lining versus, you know, a, a cold lining one, it's, as we talk about when things cool off, they tend to move and shift a little bit more, but you know, it takes quite a bit of experience of visually seeing these things and know, Hey, do we have a problem or not? Cause there's, a, there's oftentimes, that I'll get a phone call from somebody who just doesn't know. Said, "Hey, do I have a problem here?" And you know, I can look at the lining and say, "Look, the lining isn't pretty. It doesn't look right. But we have another six months of, of time that we can run on this based off how it's been wearing over the past three years, for example. You know, so it's not always, it's not always, oh, you know, oh man, do I have a problem? Do I need to shut down? Sometimes, well, no, we're good. We're going to keep an eye on it. We're going to give them a punch list of things that they're going to do on a daily or weekly basis, whether it's Flare imaging to, to, to keep an eye on the cold shell to see exactly what those temperatures are. And as they start to spike, we'll revise. You know, there, there's a number of different things that you can do. So it's not always, it's not always, oh no, it, it's failing. Sometimes it's, it looks bad, but it's fine because it's refractory is funny that way. Gotcha. So, you know, here's just another example of something starting to burn through. Mm -hmm. And this is, some actual warping going on and some bowing of the structure. So all of these are obviously, you know, red flags. They're Absolutely. signs of failure taking place. But you said something very Im interesting. You said um, some infrared imaging. You said FLIR. Um, folks, when I started my career back when the earth was cooling, Back in 1981, after I got my engineering degree at Youngstown State University, my first job was for Standard Oil of Ohio, and I supported the Lima, Ohio refinery. And one of my first jobs was they sent me to Vermont, to the Infrospection Institute, and I learned how to run a $50,000, I remember it was like a ton of money, we had to get all kinds of approvals, a $50,000 infrared camera. And it took two of us because one guy had to carry around a jug of liquid nitrogen and pour it in. And we went around and looked at refractory. We looked at insulation on pipes. And what's kind of neat is, you know, almost four years later now, for 200 bucks, I could get something that attaches to my iPhone. For 1500 bucks, I could get a standalone handheld viewer. And I can't do quite as much as what I did with the $50,000 camera, but still I can do a whole lot for hundreds of dollars now. So I think what you're telling me is even before something gets to, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. Even before something gets to this point, 
I can do some preventive maintenance, I believe, right? Or I can Absolutely. have a program, an inspection program internally, and it, it doesn't take a genius or rocket scientist, right? So oh, okay. is this something you recommend to people to have some infrared capability? This, this and Oh, I, absolutely, John. It, it's it's part. Of, it should be part of the preventative maintenance plan, or or some some people have the uh, reliability plans. It, to your point, you don't have to be an expert to understand and track this information. This is just a matter of collecting data, right? So if if on a regular basis I'm walking around this furnace and I know what my baseline is, with with a new or or, or you know average life, you know average performance of my furnace, and I know. What those temperatures are at by doing things like walking around the floor imaging and, and in hey in some cases it's just a matter of walking around the furnace and saying hey i don't remember it being this hot as i walk by this zone so it, it, sometimes it could be that simple too but a lot of times guys just either don't have the time or don't take the time to walk around and do those kind of inspections and if you do it in advance there are different ways you can come in to address this before it becomes a significant issue or certainly you know, buy time to then start scheduling things out. I mean, it, it's, it's just depending on how, what the approach is and what the application is. So let, let me let me put some words in your mouth, okay? Um, I'm guessing that you and Onyx don't want to be emergency medical technicians of the refractory world. You'd rather be a consultative partner with someone who calls you in and says, hey, look at these infrared photos. I think I'm starting to go away here a little bit. Let's plan something instead of having it be an emergency. Is that pretty pretty accurate? No, that's 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 spot on, John. I mean, it's for multiple reasons. One, if I can, if if you have the partnership, and that's really what it comes down to, is having a partnership with your customer. Like understanding, it allows me time to understand their applications, their needs, their process. Then we can start tracking that. We can be better. We can better serve them. And really, it's about getting them the most value out of their furnace and their furnace lining as possible. Um, so you you absolutely correct. For me to just rush in, do a quick repair, and leave and not be involved until there's another emergency doesn't right doesn't do anyone any good. I mean, it, it immediately gets you back up and running. But but the true value in what we do is it, it comes from getting involved with the customers and understanding their their full process. You're you're spot on. Gotcha. So. Um... One other thing just want to make everybody aware of is that there is still some asbestos out there that you need to be careful of. If you see any of you see anything that's a refractory product and it's chunks of it are laying around, if it's sure. got any age to it, it could actually have some asbestos content. And there's also silica in some applications associated with refractory. So if there's like a, a dust, um, you, you got to take some precautions before you send people into a firebox. You got to sometimes do some testing of existing materials. Is that correct? Or is there some due diligence you no, try to absolutely, do? Absolutely, John. See, uh, on, the first, on the first note on the asbestos side of things, especially when we find ourselves in some of the older facilities, some of the older steam shops and, and, and you know, industrial uh, power applications, a lot of those places are old mills that have not been any significant, haven't had significant, you know, tear out and work done. So we're always very cautious, especially when you're in the older places, you know, after it was built after the, uh, you know, early eighties, we're good, you know, but prior to that, if it's an older, which most of these industrial applications are that we're around, um, we, we have to be very cautious to, you know, look around, see if it's questionable, then you've got to get somebody on board and, and have them come in and do some pre-testing. Um, gotcha. On the silica thing you're talking about, the respirable um, crystal and silica, and that's that's been a, a hot button here the past the past few years. Um, OSHA has passed new standards, and uh, you know the first the first step is understanding where you're at, understanding the materials you're in around. You know the respirators are our first line of defense for all of our guys, but beyond that, I mean using HEPA filters and uh, filtration systems, misters, things like that. Uh, there there are a number of ways to combat it. Um, but it is something that you need to be, you know, it's always part of our plan when we walk into our, when, into our projects. It's part of our, part of our project planning. When we come in, especially if there's demolition going on there, we evaluate what we, what we know the lining to be, you know, sit, sit down and, and talk with our own, uh, our site safety guys, say, okay, here's our plan. Here's what, here's how we're going to mitigate uh, um, and reduce the, um, you know, the, the 
activity level of the uh, silica in the atmosphere. Uh, and then uh, in another area that you got to be cautious on is applications that have chrome. Um, something else uh -huh. that we have to look out for is, is it, is it, is it, is, is there hexavalent chrome um, or, or have we turned that chrome into hexavalent? We, the producer, the, the, the customer has a cut, the customer have the right scenario to turn their chrome lining into hexavalent chrome. That's something else that we need to be cautious of uh, when you're coming into these applications. Gotcha. So this, this whole safety part of it is just a whole nother underlying issue um, that oh, well, quite, from quite frankly, it's the underlying issue. It well, us, it's, well, the, it's the one because the safety across the board for us is, you know, sure. you, you're not going to be a successful contractor in this around here if you don't have an outstanding safety record. And a piece of that is understanding these kind of environments, the understanding the environment you're in, you're working in, how to keep those guys safe, how to best work, you know, having a plan to, to deal with it. Not just this, but how to plan with you know uh, the difficulties that come with demolition and, and removal of materials. It's a uh, so it, it's a very very critical piece of our of our planning procedures when we come into a in, into an account. We we sit down, take some time, and and, and we're serious about it. And we have to be. And and uh, you know I I like to tell this to people. You know I I make it very clear that I'm not the lowest cost guy for what I do. And you're really, this is, this is something where, you know, I, I tell my, my kids um, on their personal cars, buying tires is, is not the place to save money. But getting your brakes replaced, it's not the place to save money. And, I, and I'm thinking it's the same here. This is not the place to necessarily take the lowest cost bid. You better really think through what you're getting, who's doing it, what all the risks are, uh, you know, this is a place where you miss one little thing and it could be catastrophic. Absolutely. So here's some other couple of pictures here. We'll be wrapping up here in just a minute, but this is more on the hazard perspective. Tell me why you sent this and what's going on here. Well, so this, this is just a small furnace. This is a small pot furnace. And uh, what's going on, we've got multiple things going on. One, they were having an issue and weren't exactly um, on top of it. Operators didn't worry about it. They just kept running. As you can see how hot that area is still. As you look at the door on the right, this is just an evacuation door that if the pot that's a silicon carbide um, uh, crucible, if it were to crack out, this allows the material to flow out. But you can see something else was going on here as you're seeing them literally burning that steel. And uh, a couple things have gone on. One. Had they been more proactive, you know, we would not have to cut out this entire sidewall and redo this re repair, plus some significant repairs on the inside of the furnace. It would have been a, it would have been something that could have been addressed. Um, and, um, and when I say cheaper, it, you know, it's would have been less damage, would have been less downtime, which downtime to me is always more important than the cost of the refractory. While the cost of refractories can get up there, it's never, it, it's seldom the... Uh, the real cost. The real cost is found in, in you know delays in production. Yeah, but, some of the consequences here are we could literally burn employees, right? We could yes. be exposing them to flue gases and whatever other combustion products are in there. We could collapse more of the structure. The door is no longer functional, actually, right? Mm -hmm. So That's correct. Lots going on here. So here's another one. This will be our last. So. Tell me what was going on here. Sure, John. We talked about the importance of you know understanding the installation methods of, of refractory, and part of that installation method is the proper curing and drying out of your lining. Um, this particular roof was a new roof put in on a furnace. Um, this is rammed plastic, and uh, the customer decided that they would manage the dry out themselves. Um, in order to save save a few dollars, because we you know, we use outsourced companies if that's what they do for a living. They 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 fire out furnaces all over the world, um, so we, we so tend to defer hold, to the experts. Hold on, hold on there for just a second. Let's let's educate folks about what refractory curing and the dry out process sort of is. Sure, good point. So so my understanding of it is is that you put this material in, but based on the chemistry of that material and the geometry of what's going on, um, 
it might be take it to a certain temperature, hold it there for a few hours, ramp up to another temperature, hold it there for some number of hours. And it could be like even a day or two, right? Oh, sure. Well, in some, in some applications, it can be weeks. So it's, it's actually the basis of what you're saying are correct, but it's far more detailed than that. It depends on the lining material, the, you know, the, the, the actual materials themselves, the configuration, because most of these linings are multiple components. So as I have my hot face material that's designed to maintain and hold that initial temperature, my next, the le next portion of that lining might be designed to hold a temperature in, but that affects, and you have to slow down dry outs as that happens. So it's a, it's, it's actually a little bit more complicated than, than even what we're saying. So it's all dependent on the thickness of that lining and what the lining is composed of. Um, so in, it's in not only getting, like it's not only getting the right material, mixing it correctly, installing it correctly, but if you don't cure it correctly, that's what happened here. Yes, sir. That's exactly what happened here. So we, it's this was this was a ran plastic lining. And the customer said, hey, we, we've done this before. We're going to fire this out ourselves. Not a problem. You know, they saved their, you know, the, the cost of their dry out. Unfortunately, as you see in that picture on the left, where the flame is at, kind of a lazy flame there, what, uh, what was happening in their low fire, the initial part of the heat up, these burners are designed to, to drive heat. So they're usually a pencil, uh, you have the pencil tip, you know, a uh, flame, I mean, or the, or the candle wick, I'm sorry, you've got a candle wick blowing straight across the furnace, but at low fire, it tends to lick up and it doesn't have enough volume coming out. So in this particular case that we were getting the direct impingement of the flame in that section of the uh, roof there, and it caused that area to expand out, seal off. And as it started to heat up and the moisture had to be pushed out of the material, it, uh, this, is what, this is what results. This is, this is a typical steam spall is what this is. So we literally, the flame had dried out the very face of it, but not allowed the moisture to drive all the way out of the lining because of the flame impingement there. As it started going up in heat, it creates the, uh, um, as, we, as we convert the water to steam that's in there, it's uh, extremely expansive. I, I forget if it's 10 times the expansion rate, somewhere in that kind of rate, and extremely high pressures, and it, it releases. In this case, it released down because... It was the, the, the least path of, you know, path of least resistance in this section. So water, water changes volume 1,600 to 1. In yeah, not 10 times, 1,600. Okay. Yeah. I, no, that's all right. That's long. my whole life. So, <laughs> uh, you stick with refractory, I'll stick with water. But, Fair enough. <laughs> but we talked about this a little bit in our pre-work. And in fact, I told you about um, a mutual client of ours where they were doing an aluminum scrap recovery uh, vessel. And mm -hmm. I got called in because there was a horrible explosion and they thought it would, might be a combustion explosion. The stuff in the bottom of this vessel was like 18 inches thick. And it, it you know, it's kind of a concrete. I'm, I'm sorry. I know that's sure. offensive. <laughs> but gotcha. it's, it's kind of a concrete. And they have to have left weep holes for the moisture Correct. to get out of. And mm -hmm. the curing job didn't go properly. There was a horrible explosion. And it was like sending chunks of sidewalk up over everyone's head. I don't know how no one got killed or injured. It was mm -hmm. just luck. But what I hope this does for you is I hope you sit up and take notice and say to yourself, wow, okay, number one, refractory is nothing to mess with. Number two, even the curing of refractory, in my opinion, certain situations, it's another thing that I say is not a spectator sport. Mm -hmm. Depending on the job, if you don't have to be there, don't be there. Minimize the number of people around. And number three, um, it's an art. Your best shot is with somebody like Bob and his company who do this all over the world, have a wealth of experience. Um, you can get in big trouble with refractory. I hope you've gotten that message out of what we've presented to you here today. I don't know of any of my clients who have the luxury of having furnaces or ovens or boilers down for an extended period of time. 
I hope you can see here that that can easily happen. So, uh, John, one of the things that I like to point out to my customers, when they select a material, they're selecting a material based off you know, the, the, the technical data sheet, right? That data sheet showing you know, the intended properties and, the, and, and you're buying what's on the sheet. To get those intended properties, you have to have the proper installation, the proper water addition for castables, you know, the, the, the proper ramming process for ram plastic, you know, brick need to be set in the proper fashion. And, but to also to, 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 to optimize those properties, you need to have the right dry out. Without that right dry out, it affects the final properties of what's, in, of what's being installed. And if, if, so if you take a shortcut to miss that, you're not getting what you initially bought. You're getting some variation of it that's not as good because shortened dry outs affect final properties of a refractory. So it's, it's, part of the, it's part of the purchase process. And, and to get the value of what you're doing, you need to follow that whole process. And that's why you need to have guys like ourselves to know how to install it and know what we're doing. So I didn't necessarily understand when I looked at your webpage, it, it says like Onyx Construction Management. And I, and I guess I thought, well, Bob said he's like a refractory expert. And then I started looking through your website and now it's coming to me and I'm getting it. Um, you really need somebody who not only knows the materials, but knows the process, knows how to install it, knows how to cure it properly. And the chances of getting all of that in somebody who's really an expert in just nothing more than materials are really an expert in nothing more than install. Those chances are pretty low. You, you really need to manage yes. this whole process. Mm -hmm. So I get that now. So thank you. I've learned a lot about refractory. I've learned a lot about your company's capabilities. And, and I think we've achieved our original mission, which was what can you folks do better to try to stay out of big trouble? And I think the one message I'm getting there is, you know, let's not even wait till we see burned paint or something warped. Why don't you go pick up some relatively inexpensive infrared equipment? Mm -hmm. why, why don't you talk to Bob, have him come out before it's an, oh my God, we're, you know, how do I tell the boss, you know, we're, <laughs> right? We're not going to be producing for a month and get some, get some preventive maintenance process going. So you don't, you know, it's a career saving issue, right? Because how does that help your career if you're down for a month? It, I, I don't know how Shortens that would it. ever happen, right? <laughs> it tends to shorten it. Exactly, exactly. So, Bob, once again, thank you. How do people get a hold of you? John, uh, well, first of all, you know, my cell phone, and I'm one of those guys who, who's on the road and running around and doing stuff. So uh, via, via the website, we can be contacted through onyxconstruction.com. Um, you know, me directly on cell number, cell phones, always the best for me. And, uh, I'll and what is that? that? Don't be, or... don't be shy. Give us so, your cell Sure. Number. Okay. It's a uh, two, one, six, three, seven, five, seven, zero, two, one. And then my email address is B Humphrey at onyx, O N E X construction.com. Great. Yeah. We really appreciate the times here and, and, and talk with you. I mean, I could talk refractories all the time and I, I, it, it's it's always a pleasure when somebody wants to have a conversation about it so gotcha and and folks once again i appreciate you tuning into this episode i hope that you'll subscribe i hope you now have an understanding of the types of quality people and companies that i have in my network i'm always happy to help on any issue and uh again bob thank you and thank onyx for what you guys do have a great holiday. Stay healthy, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, John. Bye. Hi, it's John Pushkar. I hope you found this episode useful. If you'd like to know about more ways that I can help, you can check out my website at www.prescientts.com. There you'll find information about the Prescient Technical Services Online School, my book, Fuels and Combustion System Safety, What You Don't Know Can Kill You, 
and also about some of the consulting projects that I've been providing to clients for the past 40 years. Things like implementing inspection and testing programs on a corporate enterprise-wide level, things like reviewing and commenting on capital equipment purchases that involve combustion equipment, and even being the legal expert if things go really wrong. Once again, thank you for attending, and remember, be safe out there. The life you save, it just might be yours.